You are listening to In Pursuit of Development with Professor Dan Bannock. The overarching objective of cancer research, championed by organizations like the U.S. National Cancer Institute and the American Cancer Society, is to end cancer as we know it. Now, while the statement may suggest a future with less cancer, the stark reality unfolds quite differently. Indeed, my guest argues that modern medicine is not in the process of ending cancer, rather, we are accelerating the problem. Globally, the number of new cases each year is estimated to increase from around 18 million in 2020 to 28 million in 2040. Cancer is intrinsically related to aging and the incidence increases exponentially from the age of 50. And so the better we get at treating the disease and postponing death, the more cancer there will be in the population. In his new book, Making Sense of Cancer, From Its Evolutionary Origin to Its Societal Impact and the Ultimate Solution, Yarle discusses how aging, cancer and death are essential elements of what it means to be human. Eradicating these elements would signify not just the conclusion of cancer, but the potential demise of humanity itself. Yale Breivik is professor and head of the Department of Behavioral Medicine at the University of Oslo. He is on a mission to change the scientific discourse and the public perception of cancer. If you enjoy the show, please remember to hit the subscription button and leave a review. Please also rate us and share the episode as widely as you can in your networks. That would be much appreciated. It's a beautiful day in Oslo, Jarle. Uh, we've had some uh, snow. The sun was out earlier today. It's lovely to see you. Welcome to the basement. Thank you, Dan. It's uh, very nice to be here. Let's start with something that is rather uncomfortable. We don't really want to talk about cancer. Cancer is something that we consider bad. It's this creature we don't want in our lives. So let's start by discussing a bit, if you can tell my listeners, how should we understand cancer? Because when I, as a layman, look at the definitions of cancer, it is you know, an abnormal growth of some cells. I mean, there's always cell growth, but this is abnormal. And this abnormal growth causes problems in our bodies. Is that how we should understand cancer? Well, we should, because cancer is terrible, and it is a growth in our body. But my point is that it's also so much more. So cancer is about society. It is about our bodies. It is about economics. It is about the course of life. So that's what I'm trying to do with this book, to show that cancer is so much more than the enemy that we need to eliminate. And when we look at the whole picture, maybe we will figure out that the point is not to eliminate this enemy. Maybe it's not an enemy. Maybe it's a part of who we are. But I'm trying to sort of understand the situation at the moment because cancer, I think, globally is the second leading cause of death, if I'm not correct, right? Yes, and it's fast becoming the first cause of death in developing countries. Exactly. Because of the rising age of the population. As I understand it, so this abnormal growth of certain cells in our body is something that is inevitable as we grow old? Is that how we should understand cancer? Yes, basically, cancer development is a natural consequence of aging. The older we get, the more mutations our cells get, and sooner or later, our cells have to make a decision, or there there is a decision in our cells. Either they listen to their control mechanisms that are encoded in the genes and they shut down. They actually commit suicide, apoptosis. So that's what you should expect, and that is aging. Our cells grow old, they shut down, we get older, and eventually we die. The other alternative for the cells is that they don't listen to the control mechanisms. They get mutations in the genes that control the cell cycle, that control apoptosis, and then they go astray and they develop into cancer. 
And either way, aging or cancer for the cells, it will be the end of the human body. So if we want to do something about that, we really have to do something radical. I mean, if you grow old, it's not like you will automatically get cancer. There are many other factors, right? So, I mean, our lifestyles, the food we eat, you know, not exercising, maybe genetics. So, so it isn't just getting old, is it? No, well, it's, it's both at the same time. So we can accelerate the process, the cancer development process by smoking. That's the yeah. most terrible example of how we can promote the cancer cancer development in our own bodies. But there is also this clock ticking because every cell divisions, there are mutations. We can speed up that process by exposing ourselves to carcinogens. And so then we get cancer earlier and you can get mutations in the wrong place at the wrong time so that you are really unlucky and you get cancer early in life. Mm. But this clock that's ticking for every cell division we would have to do something very radical to get rid of or to, to stop because then we have to reverse aging. Tell us a little bit about how you see ongoing cancer research. Some of us pin our hopes on technology, science that will solve problems, and the popular media discourse is often, oh, you know, there's a new breakthrough and this is going to cure cancer or certain forms of cancer. And we also know now that certain forms of cancer are perfectly, well, fine to live with. And breast cancer, for example, it is something that we know if it's detected early or prostate cancer, it isn't as dangerous as maybe other forms, right? So tell us a little bit about the, the research that I know you've also been involved in previously in your career that addresses this problem of curing cancer or finding a cure or even perhaps a vaccine? What is the state of that research at the moment? Well, cancer research is huge and there is a lot going on in different directions. But cancer therapy in principle is about killing cancer cells. And as I said, we get more and more cancer cells the older we get. And we can kill them in the old fashioned ways of uh, surgery and chemotherapy and radiation. And now we have these very new advanced principles with immunotherapy that it's really a fantastic breakthrough and the science behind it. So that is getting our own yes. bodies to fight it, the immune system? Yes. So um, primarily the T cells in our body are able to recognize the difference between cancer cells and normal cells. And they can attack the, the cancer cells and eliminate them. And we can aid the process by using biomolecular tricks. And it works. And that, that, that's really fantastic. But the big paradox of all of this is that the better we get treating cancer and other diseases, the older we get, and the more cancer there will be in the population. So as we get better and better at treating cancer, there will be more cancer and not less cancer in the population. How so? What, what is it? Is it because we are prolonging life? Exactly. We are prolonging life. And as you said, more and more people are now living with cancer for years, maybe decades. And we are talking about cancer as a chronic disease. And in one way, that's a good thing, of course, for the individual. But if you look at society, if you got a population, an aging population, where more and more people are living with cancer as a chronic disease, we have to start asking questions. Where will this end? And how much are we going to extend life if that results in a population that are living more or less chronically with cancer? I remember one of my doctors once said, I wanted a MRI or something, uh, and he said, oh, we have to be careful with MRIs and x-rays because we don't want you to, un, you know, uh, be exposed to radiation unnecessarily. Let's try some other stuff, and that should be something that we should wait for. And I was a bit impatient. I mean, why go through this process? I want answers. So I thought that was quite interesting, and that perhaps relates to what you're saying, that maybe some of the treatments themselves can cause late life cancer. Yes. That's another big paradox in all of this, that cancer treatment 
promotes cancer later in life. Radiation therapy, cytotoxic drugs are mutagenic, so they don't uh, just kill the cancer cells, they make mutations in normal cells that can lead to cancer later on. In that way, cancer treatment also leads to more cancer. And, and that's also a, a big paradox that shows us that we are not solving the problem. Like in so many other places in society, technology are actually generating new problems. And that's what we see with cancer research and the biomedical industry in general where we, we are curing disease, but at the same time we are prolonging our lives and we are generating more age-related diseases. Okay, so let's then get to the heart of your argument, which is very provocative, and it has generated quite a lot of heated debates when you've written op-ed pieces for the New York Times, and now you have this brand new book, Making Sense of Cancer, which is being published in English today. Congratulations. Thank you very much. The argument is that we've got it all wrong, that the narrative that is dominant in the world today is battling and fighting cancer and finding a cure so that we will, at some point in, in our lives, be in a position to eliminate cancer totally. If we get it, there will be a cure and there'll be an end to cancer. And all kinds of words and terms are used to convey this ambitious hope of, a, of achieving a moonshot, yes. uh, getting funding. So the problem sometimes is formulated, as I see it in your book, that all we need is more money, yes. we need more research, and we'll find a cure, so just be a little patient. What is problematic with that approach? The basic problem is that it doesn't work. We have tried it for 50 years or 70 years, really, the war on cancer. And of course, that has generated a lot of knowledge, a lot of biotechnology, and we have cured a lot of people from cancer because of this, especially children. Childhood cancer used to be deadly in most cases. Today, most of these children's grow up and maybe have children on their own. But at the same time, the problem is not going away. The problem of cancer is growing. There are more people getting, there are more people living with, and there are more people dying of cancer today than ever before. Therefore, we have to understand the problem in a different way. And that's what I'm trying to do with this book, get more perspectives. And this perspective that it is an enemy that we need to eliminate is not really giving us a thorough understanding of the problem. Yale, would it mean that if we did not achieve all that scientific success and breakthroughs and save lives, wouldn't it mean that we would have an even larger problem today? Well, that, that depends. And I'll try something a bit different and compare this to the climate crisis, challenge, crisis really, that we are in today. Because you could say, would it be better if we didn't have the industrial revolution that has led to all of this. And of course, we wanted the, the industrial revolution. We wanted the technology. We needed the combustion engine and all of that. But maybe if we started to think about the consequences a bit earlier, maybe only 20 years ago, and we started to do something differently, we wouldn't be here today. And I'm worried where biotechnology that is driven to a large extent by cancer research, where that will take us. Because we are now going in a direction where we are changing society a lot more than what the industrial revolution, the biotechnological revolution, will really change society in a way that we can't reverse in any way, any possible way. That's why I'm saying that maybe we should start thinking differently now and not when it's too late maybe just 20 years from now. The current situation, as I understand it, let's say one of us gets cancer, we are treated, we are diagnosed first, and then if we are lucky to live in our parts of the world with healthcare, and I'm talking about, say, the Nordic countries, Norway, yeah. not necessarily the US. I mean, there you need medical insurance. 
but here we have a public healthcare system that um, screens us, we are diagnosed, and then we are in line for treatment. And depending on the uh, the, the seriousness of or the stage, I suppose, that we've reached and in the cancer hierarchy, we may receive certain treatment, but if it is a rare form that uh, leads to a very expensive solution, there may be, even in this country or in Norway, a decision made by the health authorities that I, if I have that rare form, I don't qualify for that really expensive treatment. And in that situation, I'm going to be a little upset, not just a bit, I would say, why not? Because there is that knowledge, there is that technology, there is that scientific breakthrough. Why am I not being allowed to access that treatment? Your argument in that situation would be, that is fine, that would be actually rather normal because one has to weigh this, right, with other aspects of society. Have I, have I understood you correctly? It's important to make clear that I'm not saying that I got a, the solution to this problem. I'm just opening up, trying to open up the discussion. And what you're saying is absolutely right. We're all like that. We want the best treatment for ourselves, for our children, and we want to live as long as possible, all of us. But then we have to discuss where is this drive to live as long as possible all the time taking us? What will that lead to? And I'm saying that we're now starting to see the consequences of this drive to le live as long as possible. Because we're seeing this, the cancer epidemic, which is not something biomedicine is about to solve. It's something biomedicine has generated. We have generated the cancer epidemic by better health care, by better standards of living. And then you could say, yeah, but is that wrong? No, of course it isn't wrong, but there are consequences. And we have to start thinking, is it right to treat 80-year-olds with advanced immunotherapy so that they can get a few extra months of life? There are huge expenses that could be used on other purposes. It could be used on the rising generations of health care for children, on schooling. And, of course, in your perspective, what, what we are using in the developed world, let's say the huge amounts of resources we are youth using on health care for the elderly population in Norway could, of course, be used on younger generations in lesser advanced or developed countries. Yeah. Here, we are getting into ethics. We're getting yes. into how much is a human life worth Yes, and where. So a human life, I think in your book, I saw a calculation in Norway. Is it 6.4 million kroner or something like It's this uh, quality, right? Yeah. Quality adjusted life. Life years. Life years. Yes. So using that, you could say that because we're a rich country, you know, yeah. we can have quite a lot of money invested in us. But that's only perhaps, say, until 80 years old. After that, you know, it is decreasing. Yeah. But the quality if in, in many of these low-income countries or middle-income countries around the world is even lower. Yes. In much of the world where I do my research, Yarle, there's yeah. often no oncologist. Cancer is not treated. I've just recently um, been uh, engaging in a, in a dialogue with an American organization that is going to do a health camp to screen and treat cancer patients in Malawi. So it's a huge, huge challenge. And as we discussed earlier, Sub-Saharan Africa is going to be the place where the there are the projections are between 2020 and 2040. I think I saw this at the American Cancer Society website. It, it's projected to increase by 90%. So it's a huge, huge challenge, right? So going back to the ethical aspect, the quality of life. So I think it's an interesting dilemma that you raise that saving a life of an 85-year-old, a 90-year-old here and prolonging it with a couple of months versus, you know, addressing this problem for younger generations elsewhere. But when it comes to our families, our loved ones, Yale, we become very emotional, obviously, and we want even those three months is enough. And we, we, we don't accept that 
that our family's lives are not seen to be as important as, as others. So how do we address that ethical dilemma? Should we be cold hearted and be saying, no, it's a matter of a cost aspect, saving others? It, it isn't very persuasive to, to families or individuals that are, that are undergoing this, right? No, and it is difficult. It is extremely difficult because it is about justice, it is about ethics, about looking at the individual or the family versus society as a whole, looking at uh, rich countries like Norway versus other countries where personalized immunotherapy, that, that is as far out as going for a holiday to Mars or something uh, for, for, for the general public. But in Norway, that's what we want. We want to have personalized immunotherapy. If you got, get cancer today, that, that is what, what we, we are looking for. And there is this growing divide between those that can afford this very advanced technology and those that are still at the point where we were in society like 50, 100 years ago and where the tumors are growing uncontrollably and there is not even a surgeon nearby that can remove the worst growth that is coming out of your throat or whatever. But what, what worries me is that this is becoming more and more extreme as the technology advances, and we are now having Silicon Valley billionaires that are talking about curing death. And with regenerative medicine where we can clone cells, we can develop new organs, we're seeing that this is possible. It is not entirely science fiction anymore that we can cure death. But it will be expensive. And of course, we can't cure death for everybody because then this planet will be full over not just one time, but we have to stop having children. Or there will be this big divide between very rich people that can live on for a very long time. And then you've got poor people that dies maybe even earlier by in despair than, than they did before. It's kind of worrying to see that we are not... Oh, you, you could tell me probably, are we going in the direction, in the right direction in terms of equality globally? I'm worrying that this new technology will drive it us even further apart. So there is concerns in many parts of the world that inequality, income inequality, but also other forms of inequality is increasing. Some say that globalization has, has led to even greater inequality between countries. Some have benefited more than others, but also within countries. Even the middle-income countries like India and China that have done really well, you know, you see inequality growing. So that, that, is, that is a fact. And in episode one of this season, I had Darun Asimoglu, the economist who's written a book on AI. And his major argument, together with Simon Johnson, his co-author, is that the direction of technology has to be determined by humans, that we need consultation. We need to agree on the way forward. It can't just be led by a small elite group of Silicon Valley tech entrepreneurs, that yeah. it has to be broad-based. Humans should exercise control, otherwise it's just going to run amok. By putting all our faith in technology, we may lose the bigger picture. But going back to cancer, Yarle, I mean, as I understand it from your book, there are ways in which, of course, you can treat it. One effective way is if, 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 if you have cancer in the liver, you could just replace the liver, but that's also expensive. And then you, you could try to attack those cancerous growth cells through radiation or whatever, chemotherapy, and then you could also have regenerative medicine. Yes. And you've been a part of a group at Oslo University Hospital, if I'm not mistaken, that has done some innovative work on this regenerative medicine right? or oh, immunotherapy. Yes. Tell us a little bit about what it means. I mean, what is, why is it that every Norwegian wants that? Is it something that can be personalized and, and, and is it very expensive? Is that the problem? Yes, I, I did my PhD and postdoc in the research group of Gustav Gaudernach, who is one of the pioneers in uh, in immunotherapy. And uh, the really cool thing about immunotherapy is that you use your body's own immunodefense system, which is uh, very advanced, and you direct that towards the tumor. So you can actually program by using so-called uh, therapeutic vaccines, 
you can program your own T cells to attack one specific mutation mm -hmm. in your specific cancer. And that, that is very nice. And the science behind it is just revolutionary. And there are s several uh, Nobel Prizes in that direction. And of course, it's very promising and we see that it works, but it's not the solution to cancer that either, because as I said before, we can keep on killing cancer cells, but as all our cells are developing in the direction of cancer, as we grow older, if we are going to eliminate all the cancer cells that appears in our body, and in the end, we will end up killing ourselves. And that's, that's what really happens in uh, cancer therapy. Sooner or later, it doesn't work anymore. And there is also the issue that the immune system is also getting older. So if we are going to have immunotherapy in really old people, we have to give them a new immune system. And of course, that is the direction, as you mentioned, with regenerative medicine that uh, the developments are now going, that instead of just killing cancer cells, we are renewing our body piece by piece. Is that by drawing blood from the umbilical cord when you're a baby and, and storing it and then using it later in life? Is that is that one? That's one way of doing it, yes. So you can store your own stem cells from when you were born and uh, parents are starting to do that today. They, they store the cord blood from for their babies and, and then the, the, you have that as an insurance for later in life and you can generate new tissues uh, and especially a new blood system, of course. So that, that's the easiest thing. And we have been doing that for a long time, like stem cell transplantation for leukemias, etc. That is a way of renewing the body's blood system and immune system by regenerative medicine. And in theory, we can do that for every, every organ of the body. Like you said, we can already now change the liver the problem, of course, is that you have to get this tissue from somewhere, and today we, we get it by transplanting it from dead people. But there are a lot of research on how we can develop these organs in the laboratories or maybe in pigs. The first person has received a heart transplant from a pig. He died of most probably of a virus from that pig heart. Was that in South Africa, wasn't it? Uh, I think it was, yeah. yes. So there are a lot of things going on that are taking a completely new approach where it's not about killing cancer cells anymore. It's about renewing the body, renewing your old body. And that's a very pragmatic change because we are then uh, not only treating cancer, we are treating aging. And there are real initiatives now to cure aging or to eliminate death, to put it dramatically. If we're going to in that direction, we should really think hard about what kind of society will that give us. Just to take a step back, as I understand it again, correct me if I'm wrong, cancer is can be of hundreds of different types, various types of cancer, right? Yes. So there are if I'm not wrong, some types that are more easily addressed or cured or treated than others. Yes. So when you make this argument that, you know, there is an inevitability of cancer because we're growing old, should we differentiate between certain types of cancer that we should treat and address versus some others that would lead to a greater problem. I'm thinking about cervical cancer, which is um, a big problem in many parts of the world. Perhaps that can be addressed easily. It, it affects women, it needs resources, and it is very difficult to say, no, we're not going to address it. So should we be differentiating yes, between the, different types of cancer? That, that's a very good question, because as you say, cancer can be very different things like uh, cervical cancer is related to the HPV virus, and it can be cured by vaccination. Immunization, not like the therapeutic immunocancer, uh, immunotherapy cancer vaccine I talked about earlier, but this is like you, you're immunizing against the virus, and therefore you don't develop that form of cancer. So you're absolutely right. We should differentiate between the different 
types of cancer and how we treat it. But then there is also this bigger issue, what is cancer as a principle? And then it is the same principle in all the different cases. It's just that this principle plays out differently in the different organs, in the different types of cells. Some types of cancers appear early in life, some late in life. But there is this process, as I said, there is this clock ticking. And if you have reached the age of 90 and you haven't been diagnosed with cancer, you have just not been examined closely enough. And that is good for all parties. You shouldn't you should you shouldn't need to know that you have the, this cancer in your body when you're 90 year, year old because you will probably die with that cancer and not from it but that shows that the way this process is going and like cancer in children and young adults is terrible and of course the, the, there's no argument that we should stop trying to find solutions trying to find new treatments for that but the huge number of cancers, the, the, popula- the, the, the vast population that lives with cancer today, that's the aging population. And we have to discuss how much are we going to fight the cancer epidemic just to see that it grows even bigger because we extend life even more. One important part of your argument is that this narrative that has been created that we should battle and fight and the war on cancer, that we're going to cure it, there should be no cancer, fuck cancer, whatever, yeah. projects the idea that somehow this is possible. And as I was mentioning earlier, that we need money. So one part of your argument I notice in the book is that you you are critical of big companies, even research institutions, that are perhaps pushing an illusion that is not rooted in reality. Is, is that correct? Are you, are you worried that, that people are providing money, you know, charities or rich people or even governments towards research that perhaps is not going to lead to a very concrete result, that there's this optimism created, which is false? I know you're not against research, but it is the optimism, the hope that it'll create a cure that is perhaps oversold. Yes. My biggest concern is that this way of presenting it as a problem that we're going to solve or we're going to eliminate this enemy, that is making it very difficult for the general public to understand what this is really about. What I'm trying to do, I'm not trying to to say that we, we shouldn't do cancer research or we shouldn't treat cancer patients. I'm just trying to open up the perspective and help people look at the big picture And the big picture is that cancer is a natural part of being human. And dying, like it or not, is also a natural part. It's actually a very important part of human society. And we have to be careful about this idea that we are going to eliminate cancer. We are going to eliminate aging because we have to think where will that take us as a society? And of course, the biotech industry, the medical industry, they are doing what they do. They are selling their products. And then it's very easy to, to sell the, the message that we need more money for research or you and your children will die of cancer. The fact is that the more we battle cancer, the longer we live and the more likely you are to die of cancer. Uh, a huge paradox is that the, the healthier you live, The more likely you are to reach old age, the more probable you are of dying of cancer. Uh, If you live healthy... It's depressing. Well, (laughs) I I think it's kind of nice. And I've been uh, in the Norwegian media and I I, I wrote an op-ed that said, that explained why I hope to die of cancer. And the main message is that I try to live healthy. I hope to reach old age. And then I have to be prepared to die of cancer. And then that will be okay because there are not so many all that better alternatives. And this is where I I reference Richard Smith, the former editor-in-chief of the British Medical Journal, who wrote on his BMJ blog that cancer is the best way of dying. Yeah, I read that. And he, he, he got a lot of criticism of that, of course. But, but if you look at the alternative, is it better to die of dementia? Is it better to die of uh, 
chronic heart disease, a lot of people want to die quickly uh, without knowing kind of thing. And then Richard Smith says that, well, maybe you should think about that because wouldn't it be better to, to, to prepare to say goodbye? It may be good for you, but what about people you leave behind? He said that, well, cancer is you, you get a few months or a few years of notice but when it sets in, it's usually it's quite quick. Yeah, quick. yeah I, I read that in your book that uh, he says that there are four main types. So you could die from an accident, you know, quite quickly. Uh, you could die a slow sort of death from dementia. You could have, you know, organ failure, a kidney failure, or heart failure. And then the last would be cancer, which yes. gives you, as you just said, some warning. Yeah. So you can get your... Uh, life in order, even though I must say that, that that warning is never a good warning. I mean, obviously, I mean, just knowing that there is an end in sight. And I think he was also accused of romanticizing perhaps death, you know. So, yeah. But uh, going back to the op-ed, so, yeah. so you wrote an op-ed, you know, talking about these issues in Norway, and it was provocative, but it did not generate, this is a few years ago, it did yeah. not generate the kind of attention you thought it would, that people would be up in arms and saying, or oh, defending the the uh, status quo, but you had some colleagues in private saying, "Oh, you know, this is not right," or whatever. And there would be some org- organizations like Cancer Society saying, "Oh, this is going to lead to less money." Yeah. But then in May 2016, you wrote a rather influential op-ed in New York Times, and this was just after President Obama talked about a moonshot. Yeah. and a huge investment from the U.S. government to fund cancer research, saying that they were going to eliminate this. And yeah. it was going to be headed by then-Vice President Joe Biden, who is now the president. And he had lost his son, Bo, from brain cancer. Tell us a little bit about the backlash you received and perhaps also the support from the New York Times, because that, that was the kind of attention you, you needed and you got it, which you did not get in Norway. Well, it was really a very interesting process because my message was to address Obama's moonshot and the idea that he told in his State of the Union address, now America is going to cure cancer once and for all. And that, of course, goes against what I've been trying to explain now and in the book about, no, that's not the way it works. The more we fight cancer, the more cancer there will be in the population because of this relationship with aging. Then I wrote this op-ed where I, my goal was to explain to the public and hopefully to the president how this really works. And my working title that I submitted to the New York Times was What the President Should Know About Cancer. Mm-hmm. But of course, the New York Times didn't think that was very sexy. So, so when it went to print, it said, we won't cure cancer. And I thought, okay, it's not exactly what I meant to say, but if that can get the attention uh, I want, okay. But then this was in the middle of the... The presidential campaign, right? Presidential campaign with uh, Trump uh, and all the controversies behind that. So <laughs> they were looking for this political angle to the story. And the, the online title of the op-ed was Obama's Futile Cancer Moonshot. <laughs> and then I came in the middle of this presidential election campaign and... I was then attacked as this, just another Obama hater and a Trump supporter that, that doesn't understand science and everything like that. So, so then it got a huge backlash, as you said. But people that read the article came with a lot of interesting feedback. And there you can see the different perspectives on this situation. And I actually did an analysis of all the 250 or so substantial feedback I got, like people writing substantial amount of texts that I could analyze. And I made an article for Embo Reports where I classified the different ways of understanding cancer based on this feedback. And that was very interesting because some people just said that you're, you're just stupid, like we have to fight cancer. But then there were more advanced arguments like saying that, yes, you are right, but we can't promote this message. We can't tell the public this because the public needs to hear that we are going to solve the problem or we won't drive the research and the funding. And then I thought, wow, that's kind of 
an interesting and perhaps not so ethical argument if we are looking at this in terms of democracy and telling the truth and science communication, things like that. But, but then there were also people saying that, well, now is the time. Now we got the technology. Finally, we can cure cancer. And some said, yes, because now we are going to cure aging. And that's the holy grail. And I said, yes, maybe you're right. But where will that take us? It seems to me, Arle, that it could be actually a very good strategy for all of us academics to write a provocative piece in the New York Times <laughs> and then to use the responses <laughs> to write a book because there's a lot of interesting data. But it is it is obviously something that uh, animates us, it excites us, and we want to push back uh, mm -hmm. because these are uncomfortable questions. And so this brings me to the, the final sort mm -hmm. of question or, or area I want to explore with you and that has to do with you know us being humans we there are certain crises that we just can't fathom out how we're going to solve and cancer climate you know they are, they, they're perhaps in the same category we are putting our hopes in technology AI or some radical breakthroughs we may agree with you and your argument but there's something in us that says oh but we can hope for something better that this this can't be it you know mm -hmm. we're not we will die but we want to have a good quality of life so my question to you is how should we address these societal dilemmas and there are numerous dilemmas right about making these very difficult ethical and moral choices who gets the treatment who does not how much does it cost you write about in the book that a typical a department at one of these hospitals you know making these decisions the directors making the decision i mean so what is how serious is the problem and is is this treatment going to to actually lead to um good results and how much is the cost and based on that maybe a 90 year old will not get a treatment whereas a young person will but do we have in society established guidelines for this? I mean, the hospitals perhaps have it, but as a society, what would your main argument be? How should we tackle this epidemic? What is it that we should be doing differently? How should we be addressing the problem? Obviously, we need research, we need treatment, but where should we be drawing the line? Which line and who do you think will then be most affected? I think maybe the problem is that we think that we need somebody to draw the line. and Politicians. Politicians. <laughs> and exactly, that's, that's where I wanted to go, because it's about democracy. It is about opening up. It is about letting people understand how it really works. That's my approach to it, because there is no simple solution to cancer or climate change, or in principle, to climate change, we should stop polluting with carbon dioxide, and that is in principle the solution, but there is no simple solution to, to how are we as a society going to keep on developing while maintaining our planet. And in the same way, there is no simple solution to how are we going to advance biotechnology and medicine and still remain humans the way we are today. If you add uh, artificial intelligence to that, there we have enormous problems. We don't de really fathom what we're in for at the moment. So, so my approach to this and my little contribution is to try to present science in a bigger picture and in simple language so that people can read and see this problem for what it is, or at least see more nuances to the problem, see it from different perspectives, N not just to see cancer as the enemy we are going to kill, because that is the perspective that will run us over the hill. If we can see that maybe death, maybe even death from cancer, can be a part of who we are. And it's really boiling down to how we as a society understand ourselves as human beings that are we going to be contempt with being humans that live our lives have children pass the torch to the next generation and then we die 
from old age, including cancer, or are we seeking something different? And that is, of course, the movement which they know as transhumanism, where we are going to use biotechnology, we are going to use artificial intelligence to develop something bigger and more advanced and maybe better than ourselves. But then we have to pre be prepared that this new thing that we develop won't really be concerned about us. That will be something different. And maybe we will be standing behind with our old bodies and we are humans, the, the mortal humans are transcended by artificial intelligence and biotechnologically advanced creatures that just keep on living. We have to think about this today, and it sounds kind of science fiction-y, but I think we, we now are at the level of technological development where we have to start thinking about these questions. Yeah, this reminds me of the film Avatar. You know, you, yeah. you can, we can all develop our own avatars, but also Henry Gibson's Enemy of the People. And I think if I can sort of sum up, I mean, the main takeaway I have is that we really can't sweep these uncomfortable questions under the rug, that we need to have this open discussion. So congratulations, Yale, on this book. And uh, thanks so much for this lovely, provocative, enjoyable conversation and for coming on my show today. Thank you, Dan. It's been great being here and it's been a wonderful discussion. If you enjoyed this conversation, please spread the news among friends and colleagues and share the link to the podcast on social media. You can tag us on Twitter at Global Dev Pod and Dan Bannock. Thank you for listening to In Pursuit of Development with Professor Dan Bannock from the University of Oslo. Please email your questions, comments and suggestions to inpursuitofdevelopment at gmail.com.